Hey everybody, welcome to Bobby Osinski's Inner Circle. I'm Bobby Osinski and this is a show all about music, music production, and the music business. Our guest today is Carl Tatz, who's a studio designer and creator of the Phantom Focus monitor system. But first, let's talk about the most important player in the music business. Who is that? Who is the most important player in the music business? Well, once upon a time, that used to be the record label. The record label was the center of everything. Basically, if you didn't have a deal, you couldn't get a manager. You couldn't get promotion. You couldn't get any distribution because they're the only way to distribute your recording. Today, that job has changed. Today, the most powerful person in the music business is the manager. If you don't have a manager, nothing else is going to happen. Now, managers have always been important in the music business, and none of the major superstars ever would have happened without a great manager. That being said, the center of the musical universe now revolves around the manager instead of the record deal, because an artist can have everything going for him without a record deal. That's because the manager does some things that a record label used to. For instance, promotion. Most of the promotion is now directed by the manager. Social media. Many managers have their own social media department. They direct that. Distribution. Well, if you need to distribute a CD, physical product, many times a manager will will go out and will get independent distribution. Won't worry about a record label. Street teams. It used to be a street team was the one thing that a record label could really do well. And now you find that managers are in charge of that instead of the record label. Even getting gigs where it's legal. Now, In California and New York, managers cannot, by law, go out and procure gigs for their clients. That means they would be acting as an agent. And both of those states, New York and California, have laws against that. So if you're a manager, and it doesn't matter how big or small, you can't go out and you can't get a gig. And this is how a lot of artists get out of their deals, because they say, well, back when we were first starting, you went and you got us some club gigs, and now you have to pay us back all of the royalties we've paid you. Usually, as a result, it allows the artist to leave free and clear. But in most other states, a manager will often act as an agent as well and get gigs for his artist or her artist, or the manager will act as a promoter. So the person most in charge of everything right now is the manager. The second is the promoter. The promoter is the ones that provide the gigs. So everybody else is kind of irrelevant. As far as the manager is concerned, the people they want to most satisfy is a promoter. And likewise, the promoter really wants to satisfy the manager rather than the record label, the way it used to be. So the music business today has completely changed in terms of its dynamics of power players. First of all, it's the manager. Second of all, it's the promoter. And way, way down the line is the record label. Another thing I want to talk about today is the turntable with vinyl coming back strong. And I mean really strong. Why would you want to have a turntable? Let me give you five reasons why you should own a turntable. The first thing is you get to own your own music. You don't rent it like you do online from a streaming service. You don't download it where you can't physically hold it. You own it, and you can hold it in your hands as something tangible. And there's something that, as humans, we really like about that. We like to be able to hold things in our hands. That's important to us. So that's one of the reasons why you want to be into vinyl and a turntable. You can actually hold this product in your hand. Second thing is, you can really appreciate the artwork and liner notes. An album is big enough that you can really see all of that, and you can see it very well, in most cases anyway. What we've seen in the past, back when records were really big, it wasn't unusual for someone to actually buy a record strictly based on either the liner notes or the artwork. You'd be flipping through and you'd find something that was very interesting and sight and seen, sight and heard, you would buy this. This was actually kind of normal. And of course, that never happens today. The third thing is you really have to listen to it all at once. Once you put the needle down on side of a record, you've committed yourself to listening to that side for the 20 to 25 minutes that it might take. The good part about that is it sort of gives you a window into the artist's soul. 
Because you hear more than one song, whether you like them or not, you get an idea of where they're coming from, where they're at when they're writing the songs and recording the songs. It just gives you a better feel for the artist. And it's something that you don't get in our singles digital era when we're listening to one song after another and they're not related at all for the most part. The other thing is you have to own the necessary equipment to make it work. In our digital age, we've gotten used to marginal audio gear because portability is the big thing and cheap portability especially. So we find that we've taken a hit on the audio quality in favor of that portability, in favor of that convenience. But if you have a piece of vinyl, you really have made a commitment to buying some gear in order to hear it as best you can. So in other words, you have to buy the turntable, you have to buy a cartridge and a stylus, and of course, the better each of those is, the better the reproduction is going to be. And of course, If you've gone that far, you want to have a good receiver or a good preamp and amplifier and especially a good set of speakers. Now, way back when vinyl was hot in the 70s, everybody had a good sound system. Everybody. When you're in high school, you're already getting your really good sound system that beats 95% of what you hear today. It was just a comment. Everybody had one. And of course, today, that's not the case anymore. And it's really sad because... It gave us a chance way back then to listen to things in a way that we just don't have that ability anymore, for the most part. And finally, vinyl sounds different. Some people love it, some people hate it. They hate it because of the noise, they hate it because of the ticks and pops, or they love it because of the warmth, the analog warmth. It does sound different. No matter which way you look at it, it sounds different. A lot of people think it sounds a lot better, and that's a major factor. So you have these five factors, these five reasons why vinyl and owning a turntable is something that, if you're really into music, it's a good idea, something you might want to do. So if you don't have a turntable and if you're not into vinyl, check it out, because you're going to find that it will open up some areas of music and some areas of audio that you might not have heard before. My guest today is acoustic designer Carl Tatz. He's the creator of the Phantom Focus Monitor System, which is really unique. It's really different, and he'll be talking about that, as well as talking about some studio design as well. I spoke to Carl via Skype from his facility in Nashville. So, Carl, thank you for being in my inner circle today. It's really cool to have you. Great to be here, Bobby. Big fan of yours, as you know. Well, likewise, definitely. And we'll talk more about why that is in a little bit. But first, uh, you've come to uh, studio design kind of late, late in your career. How did that happen? Um, It was uh, survival, basically. I had owned a uh, commercial studio called Recording Arts in Nashville for 18 years. And right on the cusp of when the whole commercial studio or the old commercial studio concept was going over the cliff. Um, I got an offer from Cheryl Crow to uh, sell a studio when by golly, I did. Um, Lucky break there, huh? Right. It was the second day, best day in my life. The, the, the first one was the day I started it, but <laughs> um, like they say about boats, but I wouldn't know. And, um, but prior to that, I, I saw, I saw the, uh, I saw the whole thing coming. So um, actually a, uh, a friend, friend and now my PR guy, Robbie Klein, suggested I go up to check out Cedia. And um, I went up there and I just got really excited about the whole home theater thing and um, just really took a million classes. I can't believe how hard I worked at, at that and just tried to learn as much as I could about the whole thing. And... Um, did a couple of uh, screening rooms um, along those lines and uh, just really felt like I was going to take over with my uh, commercial studio professional uh, background and uh, come to find out in Nashville that really don't build too many of the the level of uh, screening rooms that I'm familiar with or that I wanted to do. Uh, And I've done a a few beautiful ones. Um, So uh, to my surprise, um, nobody else who was, the AV companies, they weren't doing them either. And um, so I started just doing more studio stuff. And uh, But I think it was all propelled by what I call now the Phantom Focus System, which is my monitor tuning protocol. It's always been my passion, continues to be. Once that goes away, I don't know what I'll do, but that's what drives everything. <laughs> 
Well, I want to come back to that in a second, but you said that you went to CEDIA, which is a, a conference for home theater, and took some courses. Were, were, were they all uh, acoustics courses? Yeah, but you, you knew a lot about this before from Art Knoxon, right, when, when you had your own studio. Yeah, I learned from him, and, and probably more than anything, just from practice, you know, just uh, setting up my own monitors and, and uh, you know, it was a gradual thing over the course of those 18 years. I started off as a little... Uh, Fostex B16 demo studio and ended up with a full brand new SSL G plus with Ultimation and big uh, uh, Dynaudio monitors. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, I always had an appetite for it. And it goes back earlier than that. Uh, when I was uh, a kid growing up, my parents would go out, out one evening and my father had a component system, which was somewhat unusual back in those days. So I put these uh, Scott speakers, three-way speakers up on the piano and my friends came over and... Uh, you know, we got stoned and listened to Led Zeppelin and Naz, you know. As we all did back then. <laughs> yeah, right. right. That's, and that was, those were great days. Those were heady days. Yeah. <laughs> so, so to speak. But, um, uh, well, when did you feel like you were comfortable enough that you could do your own facility? Well, after you took the courses and everything, when did you feel comfortable enough that you could hire out your services? But I'll answer your first question is, um, I took a lot of acoustics uh, courses and uh, mostly from uh, Floyd Toole, Dr. Floyd Toole, who really probably influenced me more than anybody else out there and uh, continues to, you know, I've, I've uh, reviewed his, his latest book for him and, uh, you know, I don't know what the hell he's talking about, it, but it seems wonderful. <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> he's a, a giant in the industry. Yeah, he is. Yeah, he's basically what I call him the father of small room acoustics. So he influenced me a great deal. But when I went up there, I took everything. I mean, I took courses on lighting and, you know, marketing and just all kinds of stuff. And, and slowly after, after overwhelming myself with that, I mean, I would go up there and I'd see 10 minutes of the show. That's how many courses I took. Uh, and year after year. So, um, and slowly I, I, you start to refine, you know, what you like. You know, what do I want to do? And more importantly, what do I don't want to do? Um, and... I was able to narrow it down to to the kind of things that I felt like I was going to do. In other words, you know, when when I do uh, a whole house or, or rather when I do a, a home theater, <clears throat> I just bring in people to do the automation, you know, the whole house, you know, that kind of stuff. I'd rather stick needles in my eyes and do that kind of stuff, you know. But, but early on, I'm thinking, oh, yeah, I got I to learn how to do all that, you know. So so it's much more comfortable now. I'm very comfortable with what I do. Yeah. So you intended to do more screening rooms and things like that, more home facilities than studios when you first get into this, right? That's that's the way I thought. That was the plan. That's what I thought was going to happen, you know. And I, and I started off with a bang. I did a, a gorgeous one that still gets uh, reviews all the time in, in Malibu, uh, a screening room I did there. Jim Long's uh, place. <clears throat> Jim Long, yeah, of course, yeah. yeah you know, Jim. And... Um, and that continues to get, you know, it's, it's the project that doesn't die. People just keep coming back to it. So, and that was early on. So I kind of hit it out of the park right away. And I figured I was well on my way to being the, the home theater guru, especially in Nashville, because nobody had the acoustic background that I did in, you know, pro audio, pro S. But it didn't work out that way. I just got more, it was more interest in, in the pro stuff. So did people, did you solicit? work from the studios that are from people that were building studios or did that just come to you through people that you already knew or how, how did that work? Yeah. I think it just, for, like everybody just comes from word of mouth. And, um, <clears throat> you know, it's so much of it is luck. I think I'm trying to remember I, I did, I also did a, a mix of 5.1 mixer room for Jim Long. And then I'm trying to remember Then I did one for, uh, I'm probably off of my car and a lot chronology here, but um, I did one for uh, Monty Powell, who's a songwriter, a very successful songwriter, and I'm actually in the process of doing his third one in Utah right now. <clears throat> um, but I did a, a, just a really, he had a great house that he bought that had like 20 foot height ceilings that was uh, somebody's gymnasium when we turned it into a studio and a tracking room. So it was, it was very cool. And he had... Um, one of the rascal flats, Jim, uh, Jay DeMarcus over there doing some work. And then Jay bought a house. And so I got hired uh, actually first by J Joe Don Rooney from rascal flats to do a studio for him. <clears throat> and then, um, and then Jay, and then I 
both those guys sold their houses and I did stu- another studio for both of them. Uh, so that's been a great relationship I've had with, with those guys. And then, um, you know, yeah, I just word of mouth and that kind of thing. How, and and all, during this time, I was developing, you know, the Phantom Focus system. Uh, that was my next question then. So how did that happen? You went from <coughs> designing studios as a traditional designer, and, and then your focus was Phantom Focus pretty right. soon. So what, how, what was the transition there? Well, I, was, I think when I got the SSL, I realized, you know, I had a $6,500 a month note um, along with everything else. And so what I had to do is I had to get the best of the best in my studio to pay the bills. So I kind of pushed myself away from my own production and um, <clears throat> engineering, which gave me space to concentrate on the monitoring. Um, so I just kept tinkering and tinkering. I had a guy come in once and, and, and do a tuning and just realized at that point wasn't, you know, I hadn't come back a, a couple of times. And the second time I, I, I was more prepared because I wasn't happy the first time and just kind of learned. And then I, at that point I realized I had to learn software to, to do my own tuning to, to get where I wanted to go. <clears throat> and, um, again, it was that passion. I just kept developing this thing and it just keeps, I keep improving it, you know, uh, something, if I get a new idea or something else comes along, some piece of hardware, you know, I just keep improving it. <clears throat> so, okay, so Phantom Focus then. So later you're designing rooms, and how did Phantom, Phantom Focus come about? I think the first one was for this uh, contemporary Christian producer, drummer, um, <clears throat> that I, I just did it for free, and I said, just, I got this idea, let me try this, you know. And, maybe we uh, should explain what Phantom Focus is, first of all. Okay, it's what I call uh, my monitor tuning protocol. It, it's, it's, I think it's confusing and sounds exotic, and I think even though I've tried to go out of my way with my literature, I, think, I still think I'm, I come off smug somehow, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I'm really not, because I, I tell people exactly how to do it in my lectures. But it, it entails, uh, you know, hardware and software, uh, two, a pair of subwoofers, always two subwoofers. Uh, I, I corner load them in the front of the room, something I learned from, um, from Floyd Tool because it, it uh, cancels out the first and third axle uh, null. Um, so that, that dip comes right up, and that's where you're sitting. Um, and I, can, I can talk about that quite a bit. But <clears throat> um, And then uh, I use sound anchor stands. Um, which uh, Bob um, is uh, coming up with a uh, Phantom Focus edition of the, of the stand for me. Uh, we should see that pretty soon. And, um, and then a processor. I, I use a processor. Um, I've used a lot of different processors, but I'm very happy um, with the Ashley processor. And um, it's basically, you know, I modify it, and it's basically an Ashley engine, so I use that processor. But... A lot of people think that the processor is like, oh, that's, you know, that's the whole thing. It's about a third of, of what this system is. But to continue to answer your question, it's a two-day procedure. I come in with, with my assistant, and after we calculate the modes and the nulls in the room and evaluate the acoustics and whatever, I mean, these things can go in million-dollar studios, and they can also go in, in somebody's bedroom with, with the same sweet spot. It's, it's pretty daunting. Um, so once that's that's done, it takes us a whole day to do that. It's a lot of work. Uh, sometimes we're there late, late at night. Um, my assistant uh, uses four lasers um, to set it up. It's very critical, the, the, uh, what I call the null posi- positioning ensemble, which uh, for those listening to this, if you'd like to have the null positioning on- ensemble, as well as the software I use to calculate the room modes, it's on the website in the library under uh, acoustic tools. Uh, with an example, and uh, it's, this is one of the things, one of the primary things I use in the Phantom Focus system and uh, talk about in my lecture. Uh, really valuable. Uh, people go home and use this thing, and they'll go, wow, you know, so I love that. And that's without the Phantom Focus system. And then, so once it's, it's set up, which I call the rhythm section, once that's done, if you don't have that done, you're polishing a turd. Uh, once that's set up, and I'm pleased with, with what's happening, then, then I actually do the tuning with the processor. So it's, it's uh, I'd say, one-third the processor, one-third, you know, the, uh, the, and the subwoofer, 
the, in the setup and then uh, one third me, you know? Um, so uh, it's not for the faint of heart for anyone thinking that they could do this. Um, uh, I don't recommend <laughs> it. It took me years yeah. you know, to, to really refine it. So yeah, I started off at one level uh, right now. We're replacing a bunch of what I call legacy systems that have, uh, we used to use analog, you know, EQs. I started off with one uh, Meyer EQ, five band EQ, and then realized that that wasn't getting it. So I, I'd use uh, an Ashley or a, uh, a Rain mono channel for the subwoofer. So I'd had 10 bands, and now I have 144 bands. You know, not that I've ever used 144 bands, but. They're there if you need them, yeah. Yeah, the digital is so much quieter, so much so, sounds much better than a lot of people are afraid of analog. They, I was afraid of digital. Like, oh, it's going to change my sound. That may be. That may have been true early on. I was afraid of it too. That's what kept me away from it. But nowadays, it's just you know, I've done testing. Um, one of my favorite stories is uh, <clears throat> there's a engineer producer, John Merchant, um, who did a uh, a dual system for him, which means that the uh, we have near fields and bigs, and they they have the exact same frequency response. They're just wider, and might, the bigs might push more air. Um, and, um, uh, he was concerned that you might hear the, you know, the DSP, the, the processing. And I said, well, if you're into it, I'd really like to go for this on this project. So I brought in XDA, I brought in, um, which I'd used before. And, uh, I think the drive rack, I brought that in also, uh, along with, with the Ashley. And we did, uh, he's got an Avocet, which has three, three, uh, you know, speaker sends and, got all the levels matched and it was totally blind. I didn't know what you were listening to either. It was just one, two, and three and, uh, or A, B, and C, whatever it is. And, um, I couldn't get, tell the difference. You know, we, we just listened to a, uh, to a, something with, I think we used the Nora Jones. It's got a lot of presence in the vocal because that's where you're going to hear something like that. And, uh, I couldn't hear the difference. And he said, I don't know, you know, I think three, you know, I think that's it, you know, and it happened to be the Ashley. I said, well, you just saved yourself thousands of dollars, <laughs> you yeah. know, cause it was a big system, you know, that we had eight channels going to run the crossovers on the, his big tads and everything. So, um, and then of course, to, to get to my point, which is, uh, we did a, uh, hardwire bypass. So he listened to the processor on channel one or three, whatever, and then a complete bypass. In other words, nothing on the other channel. And he couldn't hear the difference. Oh, okay. Well, that says so something. So that's, that's how good this stuff is nowadays, you know. Now, I, I just have to say that when I heard the system, I, I was blown away. And you had been asking me uh, to come and hear it for a long time. Right, like I do everybody. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, it's one of those things where uh, I get asked a lot to audition things and listen to things, and and after a while, you get kind of oh blasé to the whole thing. I got to say. So, but anyway, Ken Scott and I are kind of on a book tour, mini right, book tour, right, and, right, and, right, right, and, right. and we go to uh, to Nashville, and there you are picking us up right away as, <laughs> as soon as we settle in. Yeah, right, the Blue Grotto. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you took us to a room, and both Ken and I were blown away. And what was interesting was Ken hates near-field monitors. He never uses them. I remember that, yeah. And he was blown away. What I remember, I remember two things out of that, that I should say. The first thing is how precise the imaging was, where if you, go, if you pan something 2% to the left, you can hear it. You yeah. you can hear every degree as you pan across the spectrum. It's absolutely precise. It's amazing. But the other thing that I remember was Ken listened to you, you put up a Super Tramp CD. Ken is listening to it. And Ken used to mix in sections. So he'd mix the the verse and then stop and then he'd mix the 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 B section and stop and then the chorus and then he'd splice them all together. And at the end he turned around and he says I heard a splice there that I never heard before. I remember that. And I also remember I played him Blackbird because I knew he mixed it from Beatles. And um, I remember his comment was, I, had, I never realized how out of sync McCartney's double was on the vocal. Yeah. Yeah. That was a real thrill to have him in there for sure. Um, I can tell you another recent story, but I'm not sure if I should mention names or not. A famous engineer was just in that same room for a demonstration. And... Um, 
you know, if I gave him a script, he couldn't have said anything better. <laughs> Uh, and he just swung around. He totally gutted. He was just freaking out about the, the center image um, and how he doesn't have that in his monitoring. He uses NS10s, and I pointed out to him, NS10s and a phantom focus system, system are absolutely stunning. Um, actually, one of my favorites because nothing sounds as punchy as, as an NS10. Mm -hmm. That upfront sound, so you put that with that full frequency response, it's pretty daunting. So, So that was really fun to, you know, and, you know, it's kind of kind of bad a thousand, you know, on anybody who hears it. So you, I think your point you're trying to make is I just sound like a used car salesman to myself when I talk about it. Because like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, everybody thinks it's like, you know, hypes, smoke and mirrors and, you know, what's he talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But when you sit in a seat, it's a different name. Yeah. Then I, then I, then I shut up. Yeah, I, so I got to say, uh, it makes you believer as soon as you hear. It makes you believer, that's for sure. So, uh, congratulations. That, that's it's a Thank significant you. development, I should say, and and you're getting a lot of traction with it. There's a lot of clients from a wide variety across the business, right? I, I mean, I, every time I see a press release from you, it's something you know, someone new in a different part of the business. That's yeah, I think, I think you just got the the Grand Ole Opry. I think went on. Yeah, we just upgraded uh, their system. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I, I think some people think, oh, you know, that's that's for the rich guys or real. Some I'd say more non-rich guys do it than rich guys. Matter of fact, a lot more. You know, I think it's the guys who are working and somehow, you know, word, word of mouth, of course, is always the the most powerful thing. Um, you know, they get it and they they have the the vision. Like, well, this is probably the real thing. And some people just do it just on faith, you know, just based on my reputation and other people, you know, I'll bring them over to a room and, you know, once they hear it, if, if they're seriously in the market that they'll, they'll usually do it, you know, if yeah. they've got the funds to do it. And it's, it's, it's worth it more than any other piece of gear you're going to find. What, what's, what's more important than accurate monitoring, you know? Yeah. 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 That's for sure. But, but saying, saying that I, I just want to not sound pompous. I'm a real believer that you can mix in an empty swimming pool. Um, eventually you're going to figure it out. And that's, that's an exaggeration of what everybody does anyway. Yeah. You know, from room to room, some rooms sound better than others. Uh, none of them are really accurate. Uh, they can't be because it's not, it doesn't matter what you do in the room. It's, it's, it's the speakers are a whole nother, you can't tune speakers with acoustic treatment to a degree. You can do things. Of course it's important, but not on the level we're talking about here. Um, so, you know, uh, obviously, Chris Lord Algae, for an example, you know, does great work without a out of hand focus system. But to quote, actually, uh, our friend Ed C. Um, actually, I listened to your uh, most recent uh, uh, program about who's the fellow who lives here now, the composer. Oh, Chris Borbin. Yeah, Chris Borbin. He yep. actually contacted me right after he moved to town. And he just had some question about his electrical system, um, and. Um, uh, I lost my train of thought. Where was I going with this? Ed C. Ed C. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You, you had a quote from Ed C. Yeah. Okay. That that was the story. Anyway, he said to me, you know, I've, I've got all these platinum albums and Grammys and everything, but I've always struggled. You know, obviously, you know, he does great work. Yeah. Um, and but he said he's always struggled and he's he's tired of it. You know, he got tired of it. He says, I'm doing this fan focus system at this stage in my career because I deserve it. Yeah. <laughs> You know, yeah, and and that's that's great, and, and I think if more people uh, thought that way, you know, I think that their lives would be more enjoyable. That's what it, it's so enjoyable to to have finally have the real thing, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, what have is I, have I have I sold this enough yet? <laughs> well, I want one. <laughs> uh, okay, I got you. But down. I heard it already. So, uh, All right. so tell me about the uh, RLX Signature Series. Okay. Um, that's something, an idea I had. This, this probably started like three years ago, I think. And um, I was looking for a company to hook up with who would get my idea. And, and the idea is that not everybody can afford my custom studio designs. But if we could do some sort of light version of that, where they could put these modules up on the wall, and especially out of Phantom Focus System, again, in, in a bedroom, um, it would be extremely rewarding. So finally, um, 
that seems to be coming to fruition. I know uh, Orlick just had a, a, uh, uh, a meeting in Detroit with a Vintage King to do uh, an exclusive on the Carl Tatt Signature Series uh, control room. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure what they're calling it. Actually, the, I've seen the, uh, the, uh, the web uh, art on it, uh, but I don't think it's up on the, there, there is a Phantom Focus, uh, or rather a, a Signature Series uh, thing on, on the website now, but there's a new one. So apparently this is going to be available and they're, they're getting prices, I mean, pricing on it, so that uh, the average guy, you know, who doesn't have, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars or tens of thousands of dollars can get one of these setups, put it up himself, uh, and and with, uh, with the hopes that, you know, if, if he, you know, has a budget to do a Phantom Focus system, you know, he will be, he will have the best mix room basically in the world in his bedroom you know and, and this is what um acoustic panels and diffusion I, uh, yeah, I guess, right? yeah like yeah you can just if you look at my rooms I, I think the key elements are those uh my signature thing that i do uh i know other, other designers uh, you know you can look at a picture and you can know right away you know who designed it um my thing is obviously those columns that yeah. you see on the side which i call the acoustic lens and they're partially absorptive, <clears throat> possibly partially reflective. And uh, this is just my theory of, of what I do. We, you know, every one of us tries to do the best job we can, and we're passionate about it. So my thing is to keep it uh, <clears throat> sort of live and diffusive on the sides, so that you know those things. Even though there's a foot in between each column, if you clap your hands, there's no slap. Yeah. And and they catch the the sound kind of. Uh, of the speakers kind of combs along the side of it and, and catches it and diffuses it and confuses it. So it's diffusion, absorption, and reflection is what happens with that. And then um, a cloud, you know, you want to catch, you know, commonly you want to catch the first reflections. So you want to get, get a cloud. You don't want something bouncing off the ceiling um, or the side walls. I mean, the acoustic lens takes care of that. And then the back wall, um, you know, not everyone will agree with me, but I'm a believer in having the back wall totally dead and absorptive yeah. I, I don't believe in diffusion on the back wall to me it's like why would i want the sound to come back to me yeah. and, and and cause some kind of comb filtering so uh in a 5.1 room there's then there's an argument to do some other things but generally in stereo that that's it so that's how that came about um i just kind of put it out there and uh to uh eric smith's credit who owns orlex president and owner and founder he just jumped in his car and drove down from Indiana, and uh, he was on board, you know, and that's what I was looking for, uh, and also someone who could probably promote it, you know, when the time came. Yeah. Um, so that's how that, that came about. Incidentally, you probably don't know about this because um, it hasn't been announced yet, but uh, Argosy is coming out with the Carl Tetz edition uh, line of consoles. Oh, very cool. And I use a lot of those. And what's so special about those? Um. They look good. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, I'm a big fan of the uh, what they call the Dual 15. There's a Dual 15 and Dual 15K with the 800 modules, and those are the ones where the the rack modules go up and then they slide down in the back. They're not flat on top, and uh, it's just a perfect complement to the Phantom Focus system um, <clears throat> for the imaging. Uh, which, as you know, is very dramatic. So yeah. to have that big open space and, and minimizing the, the console uh, bounce. Um, the signature series, uh, or rather the, uh, the Carl Tass Design Edition, uh, is, has a lot of mahogany on, on the top. Uh, we just uh, got one. Actually, there's two installed now. There's a very custom one on, uh, you can see on the web, on a studio called Yellow Hammer, uh, actually, which is been uh, presented for a tech award in other words i presented it uh, they've asked me to submit a, a studio and i've submitted that one but that was a technical one and that's actually where the idea came along um where that's got a lot of mahogany in it it's it's a it's a wider desk um to accommodate some um monitoring you need uh video monitoring needs he had uh and so there's the regular width one the wider width one uh, of both the regular uh, Dual 15 and the Dual 15K, and the K is a uh, as a keyboard in it. So oh, I see. Yeah. They're working on the renderings now. I need to uh, get a photo of Bob's. We just uh, he he had an original uh, Dual 15 
and now uh, they went ahead and said you can upgrade uh, to a uh, to to the Carl Tatz edition. Uh, they, they just send you the modules, and, and you can just replace the the black part of the front with it with this beautiful mahogany. So we'll be seeing that pretty soon. There's a lot of people that are listening to this that probably can't afford your services, and I'm sure it would be up for the signature series, but if there's one thing that they could do to a room to improve it, in your opinion, what would that be? I'm not sure about one thing, but yeah, I, I would say that the number one thing that I think is important is uh, symmetry. Uh, to have a shoebox is the ideal room. Um, I know they see a lot of designers, you know, that have splayed walls and things like that. A lot of them aren't splayed at all. Uh, they're just rectangles with fabric making it look like it's splayed. Um, <clears throat> and some of them are, are splayed. And, um, you know, they have their way of doing things. I have my way. But with, with the shoebox, you can really calculate the modes. And, and uh, uh, it just it works well for me. So symmetry, is, uh, I'd say, would be number one. Um, and then kind of as we, as we spoke, uh, you know, getting a cloud, getting, taking care of the first reflections, I think would be number two, uh, including the back wall. Um, and, um, and then, you know, calculating what your, uh, where your modes are and where your nulls are. And as I mentioned, they can go on the website and, and find those, a uh, couple of those tools on the website, which I think are, I mean, it's, it seems like nothing, but I can't tell you how big a deal it is. And I, I, think, I just looked at those, actually, before oh, we did this, oh, okay, and I okay. thought they were very cool. Yeah, you bet. They are yeah. very useful. Yeah, the, the null positioning ensemble is, is something. I mean, I, I didn't invent a modal calculation, but the null positioning ensemble is, is pretty unique. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and, and just kind of guarantees, guarantees results uh, relative to imaging. You know, so if you do everything, you know, if you if – you, place your monitors, your null ensemble in between the nulls, and you do everything right, you're going to get great imaging, but you're not necessarily going to get great frequency response. Um, uh, in theory, you know, it should be very good, but <clears throat> you still might be very bay shy. There's still all kinds of anomalies that can be happening in a room, depending on how, how it's built and surfaces, things like that, or thicknesses of walls. So you might have to slide if you're really base shy, you might need to slide the whole thing forward toward a toward a wall and get support that way. Yeah. But image, imaging, those are imaging tools. As far as the frequency response, that's where the, the PFS comes in. Yeah, got it. Yeah. But again, they'll learn it, and, and they, I think, if they have the imaging and they play with the frequency by moving it, you know, start start by using the null ensemble relative to the to the uh, modes. Start with that, and then. What we do, I and mean, we do the same thing. We'll move it out six inches. We'll move it back six inches, and just see if there's a, a pocket there. Just like you know, putting a pocket in a uh, putting a vocal in, in a track. Yeah, Sometimes yeah. There's just a moment where we're like, "Whoa, that's it!" You know. Yeah. A little yeah. magic happens. You get to see a wide swath of the music business because you're doing rooms for all parts of it. So, in your business, or in your opinion, how is it going? What, what do you see actually going well? What do you see not going well? What I see is, you know, uh, the new paradigm is the personal studio that, you know, just about everybody has. When obviously there's probably more studios in this town than any place uh, in the world. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, home studios, you know, what I call personal studios, um, where people, they'll do, they can do the whole thing there, but, I think more than, if, you know, if they're working with a band, then they'll want a tracking space. Uh, but I think probably the most popular thing is, is a, a mix room and a booth. Because there, you know, you can, you can do a whole album in five days tracking, you know, at a, at a real studio, so to speak. Because um, who wants to go through with all that crazy, you know, madhouse stuff with, with tracking, although it is exciting. Um, but, you know, you can go to a real, you can go to Blackbird or someplace like that, and they got the best, best of best equipment, and then you get your tracks. Then you come back, you do all your vocals, all your overdubs, uh, and you can mix. So I think that's what I see. Um, as far as what's not working, I don't know. 
Do you have a suggestion on what might not be working? <laughs> <laughs> well, Maybe I could go down that tangent. I don't know. Well, I mean, from the standpoint that the, I, I guess you just answered that, really, where it, the trend is more to personal studios and away from larger facilities, which we've seen, um, you know, over the, the last, well, bunch of years. But what's interesting that I see is the studios that are still standing are pretty busy at this point. They're, they're doing well. Now, I don't know if there's, we're going to see any new ones but uh, they seem to be doing well. What's what's left? Uh, At least yeah, in LA that I know of. I, I'm not so sure about Nashville, but but here. Yeah, and I don't I don't know so much about Nashville know, or or about LA either. Um, it's um, I, I think here, you know, all the big studios are owned by very well, wealthy people, and I don't think they're the businesses that they were years ago. Um, no one knows for sure whether they're making any money, whether they're surviving or what. You know, I've got friends in New York who own studios, and I know it's very tough. Uh, you know, and there's a lot less commercial rooms than there used to be. But still, you know, probably in New York, it's a, it's a lot harder to probably do a personal studio in the city um, just because of real estate. Um, and, um, yeah, I mean, that's interesting. You're telling me something I don't exactly know in, uh, in L.A. Yeah. What's going on there? Yeah. What's the thing that helps you most in your job? Me. Yeah. Knowing what I want to hear, you know, knowing how I want it to go. I think that's true with anybody, like any engineer, you know, that what distinguishes a great engineer from, uh, you know, a mediocre engineer is, is not the gear. It's knowing what it's supposed to sound like. And, and if it doesn't sound that way, you're going to make it sound that way. The reference right? point. Yeah. 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 What, what, do you use, what do you use for reference material? Oh, I have a, uh, I have a, uh, a new disc actually just came out. It's the uh, Phantom Focus reference disc. Hold on, show this. Oh, very cool. I know you folks at home can't see this on the radio, but <laughs> um, that's actually Yellow Hammer. I don't know. Can you see that? Ah, uh, there we go. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. And so uh, these are cuts that I actually use uh, for tuning. Uh, this is the second generation of them. Um, some of the cuts, I have certain cuts, I, I change from time to time. Right now, the first cut I play is, uh, Only Trust Your Heart by Diana Krall, Al Schmidt mixed. Yeah. And it's just, uh, you know, full spectrum acoustic kind of stuff. And that kind of tells me, you know, what's going on. It's got an upright bass. You know, if the, if the upright bass blooms too much, that tells me I've got a resonance problem, um, which doesn't happen very often, but it's one of the two things that happen when, I, when I'm doing these things is if there's a resonant problem, like where a particular frequency freaks out, and that'll usually come across when I use my trans, um, my coherence function in, in smart, it'll show me that or it'll verify that. That'll tell basically um, coherence is a, uh, is a tool that tells you how accurate, you know, the, the analyzer is, how accurate the information the analyzer is giving you. Yeah. So it's, it's telling you, so if you see, you know, a strong coherence uh, trace coming down, what it's telling you, it's not telling you um, this is wrong and you can't boost it or you can't cut it. It's just telling, telling you, I don't know. I'm not smart enough to tell you what's going on. Um, that, and, and like we spoke, asymmet uh, asymmetry, when it's asymmetrical, when you're closer to one wall than the other than you got, then that's a tough one. Yeah. Um, but cuts here, I, I use uh, Kevin Gilbert's uh, Goodness Gracious, John Mayer Gravity, um, Mary Shut the Garden Door, Donald Fagan, uh, Line Them Up, of course, uh, James Taylor. Um, uh, recently, uh, I did a, uh, I learned from my clients, and I did a couple of studios for uh, MTSU, and one of the engineers turned me on to uh, a cut by Drew Zing. You probably know him. Guitar player? L.A. session player? No, I don't, actually. Oh, you do what? And uh, anyway, he knows all these guys. Uh, so he had Michael McDonald come in and sing um, a real funky version of uh, Easy. And it, it's just stunning. You know, it's just the bass sounds amazing and, and Michael McDonald's voice really up front. Yeah. So that's a lot of fun. Uh, some of the, a couple of the new things I've added is uh, Daft Punk uh, doing it right. I yeah. love that cut. Yeah. Uh, you know, when the, those synth parts come in, it's, uh, it's uh, very exciting. Um, and then uh, Mike 
Aspen client turned me on to a Paula Cole cut called Sex. That's Kevin Killen mixed it, and it just hands from left. It's just amazing, you know. You listen to it like that's that's what I want to be when I grow up. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. How can someone get this disc? <clears throat> they need to purchase a Phantom Focus system. So I, <laughs> okay, I, I keep it exclusive in, in that sense. Ah, uh, perfect. Yeah, I I can, it. it's, so it's the most expensive CD ever. <laughs> Okay, last question. What's the best piece of business advice that you've either gotten from someone or that you've learned through your career? Uh, you're worth what you charge. Love it. Love it. And that's, that's really true, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it's just that I think it, you know, it comes after you've acquired the confidence to, to say that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Excellent. But, uh, yeah, yeah, I've learned that from, a, I can't think of the guy's name. He's a guy who made pre, he's probably still around, he does prefab uh, acoustic uh, uh, treatment for uh, home theaters. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's a good piece of advice for everybody, yeah. that's for sure. Carl, yeah, thanks for, thanks for, so much for being here. I appreciate it. It's been, totally my totally my pleasure. I, I, I just uh, love everything you do. I read all your, your blogs, and uh, I know you. I've been... Uh, lucky enough to be in one of your books and and uh so uh i just think you're one of our our uh, industry's icons so well thank you so much and likewise you're going to be known for a long time for the phantom focus system believe me let's see thanks carl all right buddy if you want to find out more about Carl and his Phantom Focus system, go to carltatsdesign.com. That's all one word, carltatz, T-A-T-Z, design.com, carltatsdesign.com. Thanks for listening and being in my inner circle. Remember, if you have any questions or comments, send them to questions at bobbyoinnercircle.com. Many thanks to Steve Cherubino, who is instrumental in putting this podcast together. He's the host of the EDM producer podcast at EDMMR. To listen to other episodes of Bobby O's Inner Circle, go to bobbyosinski.com and select the podcast tab, or go to bobbyoinnercircle.com where you can find it on iTunes. At bobbyosinski.com, you can find out more about my books, you can read some excerpts there, there are links to my blogs, and you can find out more about my coaching programs. And there's a sign-up sheet for my newsletter, as well as a sign-up for alerts for new podcasts. This is Bobby Osinski, and I'll see you next time. 